But uh, I want you to go with me to Ephesians, the uh, fourth chapter and verse 15. This morning, I want to continue a series that the Lord gave me last year at the end of the year, and I've been preaching into this about grow. And our theme for this first of the month of the year is grow. So we want you to make sure that you have that information and that you get an opportunity. We're going to be preaching that. You can go to our website if you missed last week or the week before. You can go to the website. It's uh, on there. And we want to make sure that you stay with us on and throughout this series. And I've got um, the message next week. I'm going to be finishing up this series. I'm going to be preaching about the last two letters. I used uh, an acrostic, if you will, on grow. And so I'm, I'm going to be preaching about the R today, and we're going to be preaching about what it means to, and this, this will be what you'll find in the, in, the, in, the, in the bulletins, and you'll also see this. It's called Read, Repent, Repeat. Everybody say that with me. Read, Repent, Repeat repeat. We're going to talk about that this morning. That's part of the growth process. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, this is our scripture that we've used as a pivotal scripture for throughout this study. It's in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. This morning, I want to share with you just a little bit about this idea. The first message that I preached was found uh, where we talked about giving ourselves to God completely allowing ourselves to be totally his you see it's not just enough to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ but he must be Lord of your life that's giving yourself totally and surrendering yourself to him when a lot of times people want to give to themselves to God but they only want to give part of him they want to want to give a little bit of him they don't want to give all of him he wants to be Lord of everything you are everything you have Everything about you, you need to understand, God wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the theme of your life. So we've been looking and, and talking a little bit about this idea of surrender and what it means to surrender ourselves. And we talked a little bit about that. A few weeks ago when we were talking about giving ourselves completely to God. Today we're going to talk about read, repent, and, and repeat. And this idea of reading the Word of God. It is not something that we should take a, 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 and look at and say that we just need a little bit of it. And just a little bit. Of, yeah, it's not like the Brill Cream commercial, a little dab will do you. We, we need all the Word of God that we can. Because the more of the Word of God that gets into us, the more that it can transform us. It is the word that sets us free. It is the word that transforms us. And so I just want to make sure that you're with me today. How many of you are with me? You're staying with me today. Keep your word out and keep your word open so you can follow along. We'll have it up on the screen. If you need help, we have our, our Spanish translator is Laura back there. She's translating. She's talking as fast as she can to stay up with me. Uh, but she's translating. If you need a listening device to help you with the translation, it's back there on the back table. And uh, we, she does a great job staying with me and following along. But this morning we're going to talk about this idea of read, repent, and repeat. You're going to hear that several times because that's the way our life should be. I believe that everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that comes from us should be something that we have digested through the Word of God. So many times we are stifled in our growth because we are not digesting the Word enough to transform our life. And we get a little bit of God's word and we suffice to say that that's enough. Not enough to conflict us, not enough to convict us, not enough to transform us. We get enough of the word of God so that we feel good about ourselves and we feel good about what we've done. It is not just a Sunday morning experience that I'm preaching on today. I believe that this is something that we must do every day completely so that we can transform. Amen. Now, without asking too much of a question, too personal of a question, how many of you ate one time in the last two weeks? How many of you ate in the last two minutes? Two hours? Some of you, listen, here's what I'm going to ask you is this. What if you were to treat your spiritual man the way you do your physical man? 
You see, what feeds your spiritual man is, is the things that I'm talking about. And that's the word of God that feeds into us to transform us and change us. It helps us to grow. One of the things that the doctor told my mom when she was looking at me and they, the doctor said, well, his growth is stunted and, and he needs to eat the right kinds of foods that will stimulate and help him grow. Did it, the doctor tell anybody else that or was I just a special child? But, and he looked at me and, 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 and he said, you, your son needs to eat. And at that time, they said he needs to eat milk, drink plenty of milk eat eggs he needs to eat meat and he needs to eat uh, proteins and he needs to eat and he needs to to eat it on a regular basis all of those things will help you grow well it didn't work all it did was make me round but when I look at this idea of what it means to basically and from my text this morning a little bit down if you will go ahead and pull that up if you go back just a few verses in Ephesians, the, the, the fourth chapter, verse 11 says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 3, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. When I looked at that, that jumped out at me and I began to think about it. There is a reason why God has us and all of the positions that he mentions there in verse 11 are, are should be uh, examples of ministries in the church that are going on. But it's not just in the church. We should see these ministries happening in our life and in our home and in our families. We should see this begin to take place. And he says that it's for the equipping of the saints. It's for the equipping. It's so that you can be prepared. That word equipped means prepared for whatever may come your way. That's what we do, and that's what we should be about. And we should be in that, and the, and the church should not be centered on entertainment, but in the word, because that is the only thing that will equip the spiritual man is the word of God. And I know that there are churches that have become social clubs and they are, they're more about the events and they're more about all the other things, but we still cannot get away from the value that we must place upon the Word of God in our churches and in our lives and in our homes and in our families. There is nothing that is more important. I love worship. I love to have fun. I love to, to, uh, the, the events where we have it. Come on, I love to eat. But I will tell you, there is nothing more important for me as a spiritual man than I get in the Word of God. That is the priority. I have a friend of mine who was showing me and he sent me his sermon outline and it is a, it is a message that was quite entertaining, but it only had, it had one scripture and everything else was, it sounded like counseling from a psychologist's office. And I told him, I said, in order for God to truly anoint it, you need more of the word in your scriptures and in your sermon. We think about the idea of what God is speaking to us. You see, it says there, if you go down and, and it talks about it, he says, until we have come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. There's only one way that you'll know God's Son, Jesus Christ, because he is the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. He is the fulfillment of God's promise. He is the Word of God. The Bible says, know the Word, and the Word will set you free. When we look at this, we begin to define it and we begin to think about it in so many different ways. You see, I believe that the church and, and us as believers, we should be disciples, discipling others until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. It is not just about us, but it is about who He is. We should be discipling or mentoring someone to come to a knowledge of Christ. When we look at this scripture, I chose that picture of Joe. I don't know if that one will win or not, but I, that picture contest. But anyways, it's some good looking dudes there. But when I was sitting there and I, and I thought about this idea and I thought about the, the, this contest that I'm speaking of, it's, it's so much fun and I love those kind of things. But I looked at that and I, I thought the church must be about the process 
of us discipling. You see, when Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and he said, and some translations say, follow me as I follow Christ. You see, it's not about, Paul was not saying, look at me. And, and we're not about any big eyes and little use. That's not what it's about. It's not about somebody being puffed up and, and, and put on a pedestal. Please listen to this. I'm telling you, you should make this the discipling role in your home, in your family, in your house. It should be everything about it. Everything You, you need to find somebody. How many of you go to work every day? How many of you know right now that there are people in your, in your, that, that you work with, that you work with, that you know that are not right with God? You have a task. You have a mission field. You have an opportunity. You have a, a word from God to step out and do the work for him. You have this process that God has placed within us. Disciples making disciples is something that each of us should do. Because when we live it before them, they will automatically see something in us that they need and they will reach out to that message. The work of God and the word of God through us reaching others. You see, eventually, I don't want them to see me, but I want to see them see Christ in me. That should be the goal of each of us. Go ahead and pull the next one up, Robert. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter in verse 15, it says, Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth, the word, the message, the word of God, studying to put yourselves into it. You see, it's not just like any other book. Here's what a lot of us, and, and this is what happens with so many of us. We take the word of God and we try to make it like a magazine. We try to make it, and there are, there are Bibles that have, have been converted into easy read messages where you can read it like a magazine, you can read it like a novel, you can read it like other books. But I'm going to tell you something, this book is like no other book. I believe it must be different. It must maintain its identity of what it is. It must maintain the purity of where it came from and how it got it. Listen, I'm not worried about what translation as much as you read, but I am worried about the fact that you take away and water down the truth of it. That's what's happening in the world today. We need to study so we know what we know. Because we have believers that have been believers in the church for years that still aren't sure what it says in this book. If we are to know the truth and the truth will set us free, no wonder the church is bound by all kinds of oppression and spiritual warfare. Is because we don't know the word. And it has stifled the growth of the church. That's why the church is struggling. You see, you, you, there are churches, and I'm not criticizing and I'm not bashing churches today, believe it or not. I'm really not doing that. But I will tell you something. The reason that a lot of churches have become, uh, to the, they've, they've had these mega churches is because basically people, sinners come in and they feel a, a safe place to come. You know what? A church should not be a safe place for sinners. They ought to be the most uncomfortable people in this building right now. Because I'm going to tell you something, if they're not on pins and needles, that means we're not praying and living right. Uh-oh. I can see right now by the looks that are piercing through me that that hit a nerve. But I'm going to tell you something. If the word of God in the presence of a conviction of a person that is living in sin, they ought to feel it around you when you talk. They ought to see it and be convicted in your lifestyle. There should be something that they say, wow, man, I kind of get the weird feelings. And I've had people that have turned around and they've been around me and they'll turn around and, there, is there something wrong with you today? And, and I'm thinking, no, no, I'm fine. But they're breaking out in a sweat. It, it, it's because of the Jesus in me is convicting the, the work of the enemy that's in them. When Jesus walked up to the, 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 all he did was walk on the shores and the man that was demon possessed came running to him and said, why do you persecute me? When's the last time somebody at your work ran up to you and said, why are you persecuting me? Believe it or not, that might happen more in some people's businesses. But I will tell you, Here's what it is. When we begin to study and begin to work and the word of God becomes more than just a book that we read, but it's a, a word that we live on and digest and read. I can tell you this. I, I challenge you. Start memorizing the word of God. 
How many of you right now would say, I can't memorize it? I can't memorize the word. Come on, I know that some of you are just like me. The closest thing you come to remembering is your phone number, and that's because you... The other day, I got a phone call uh, from somebody, and they said, well, what is your wife's phone number? I said, I don't know. Let me get my phone, and I got to check. A lot of times, we don't even know the phone numbers anymore. We don't have to memorize because it's all just on the push of the button. And some of us, we don't know the name, so if we don't have the picture, we can't tell who it is. We've made it so easy with the access to this that we just take for granted. We don't even, we don't even have to follow along with the preacher because we just trust him so much. I, I told somebody the other day, if you misquote a scripture from the pulpit, it ought to offend. Somebody ought to run up and say, here, read this. When we look at this, we begin to see this. There's more to to the Word of God than just to read it. We must study it. If we're going to grow, we must learn what it means to study the Word of God. I'm not talking about studying for a degree. Those are great things to accomplish. And if God calls you to a particular ministry or a particular position, then you need to strive to do your best to do it. You need to study so that you can be useful in the hands of God. But you need to study so you can learn, so you can be used by God. You can memorize scripture. Come on. You can work at it. You can try it. Try simple, start small, and build up to bigger things. Work on one scripture. Today we had one scripture. Ephesians 4, 15. How many of you already forgot where it was found? Ephesians 4, 15. Get it in your spirit and read it and read it and read it and read it. John 3, 16. How many of you can say it? Oh, come on. How many of you can quote the 23rd Psalms? How many of you can, can tell me? Uh, all, you, there's a scripture that, my, my favorite scripture. Some of you know it. It's Romans 6, 23. Uh, some of you need to, to but here's what I'm going to tell you. When you say you can't, you are basically making God a liar. Because my scripture tells me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the minute that I begin to study the word of God and I begin to say, God, I can do this, God will amplify the effort that I put in. It's that you, the effort that you want to study to learn it. Amen. Is it valuable to you to learn the word of God? Or is it just something that, well, I, I, did, my, I did my two hours. I read my two hours, put my Bible up. I'm done for tonight. Did it change me? Did it affect me? How is it affecting me? What's it doing in my life? Go ahead and pull the next one up. I got a few scriptures here that I wanted to show you about the word of God. He says, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119. If you you want to read about the word of God, all of Psalms 119 is great. But he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, I like what Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12 says this. It says, for the power, for the word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When I saw that, those scriptures, I, I put those out there and I wanted to say, if you're writing down my scriptures, you need to write those down. You need to put them down and you need to begin to see that because I'm going to tell you something. When I take the sword of the spirit, it cuts to the, it should convict us. When I read the word of God, I should look at it and I should say, where am I missing lining up with this? Come on. There's a lot of people that like to read stuff that they line up with because it makes them feel good. Amen. I don't, I don't particularly like it when somebody says, hey, you're fat. I, I went to the doctor the other day. My knee was hurting, and I was having some other issues, some health issues. And, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor looked at me, and, and he went all, did blood work and did these things and did all this stuff. And he, he came back, and he sat down, and we went over the, the results of it. And he said, well, let me tell you, I can tell you a couple things. Now, 
this guy went a lot of years to school to tell me, you need to lose weight. I thought, what? He said, and you need to exercise more. I about stepped off that platform and smacked him good. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know what I just paid to come see you and all them tests run, and now you're telling me I'm fat and I need to do more exercise? My wife tells me that. I didn't need to come see you for that. And I began to look at that, and I, I thought, the conviction that we have cannot be about the facts. It must be the truth. The conviction that God wants in us is life-changing. And, and the Word of God should be something that when we look at it, it should convict us to change us. Because we see where we're missing and what we need to do to change. You see, sometimes we, we, we get people get, start con getting convicted in their heart about their life and, they, and, God, and the Holy Spirit will deal with them through the worship songs or maybe through the Word and, and they'll, they'll feel convicted about changing their life. But because they never get in to see it in the Word of God that where they're missing and the reflection that they're missing on, they don't know what to do next. And oftentimes, they just stagnantly wander by and they miss it. You see, I believe with all my heart that God is trying to tell us something today. That if we truly need to know what we need to know, we need to get in the scriptures to grow. To grow spiritually, we must have the word. And we must have the word of God. Not just any word or a word, but a word of God. I don't want to run around and listen to others talk about God. I want to read about him myself. To read about him is to know him. I believe with all my heart that God wants us to have three things out of the Word of God every time that you read the Word of God. We need direction, we need correction, and we need reflection. Look at those three things, and I want you to say them with me because I think some of you are, are, are getting tired on me. Stay with me. The first thing is we need direction. Come on, say it. We need direction. We need direction. Come on, I was lost, but now I'm found. Why am I found? Because I followed God's direction, amen. And God showed me where I was missing it. I need direction so I know what to do next. What am I going to do? I, I went through my teenage years and on into my college years, and I began to ponder the fact, what am I going to do for my future? Anybody ever ask that question? Some of you right now, some of you young teenagers and you young adults, you're going through that. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? That's normal at this point, but I'm going to tell you something. What you can do is open the Word of God, and as you begin to open the Word of God, God will clearly design your direction. He says the steps of a righteous man are provided for by God. There's no way to be righteous without God's Word in me. I need it for direction. I need it for correction. I need to know where I'm wrong and make it right. Come on. God doesn't have his word so he can beat us over the head. Amen? When God wants us to correct us, it's to keep us going. How many of you know the 23rd Psalm? We quote it. We read it. We, one, of the, one of my favorite parts of that is the, the Lord being my shepherd. He has a rod and a staff that will correct me. When I get out of line... You know what the hook is on the, the, on the staff for? It's to ring a sheep around the neck to get them back in line. To catch it by the hoof and drag it physically back where it should be. Because if the shepherd didn't care, he would let us wander off and we would be given, uh, eaten by a ravaged wolf that would destroy us. Because the Bible says he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he uses the word to correct us and direct us. Anybody ever felt God's hook around your neck before? I felt it. I felt it this past week. I, I felt it when God began to take that and he began to say, you need to get back where you need to be. And God loves us enough that he won't let us wander off and he won't let us wander away. And that's why we need to understand God's word begins to create in us the atmosphere. I need to know. 
Do you know that there are people that read the Word of God and the Word of God will tell you not to do something, but because we want to do it, we ignore it? Amen? Amen? We, we overstep our convictions and we overstep the corrections of God because we want to do it the way we want it. We want the word of God to bend the truth so that it fits what we want. And if the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. If the Bible says that we must do this, we must do this. Listen, I can tell you this. I believe without a, I, I was talking to someone the other day and, and, and they became very offended at me. Because I quoted a scripture about what the Bible says, that a man should not lay with a man and a woman should not lay with a woman. It is ungodly before God. It's an abomination before God. And they got mad at me. And I said, you don't need to take that up and be mad at me. You need to take it up with God. God said it. I didn't. God did. And the path that you're going down is going to lead to their destruction. When, when God's word says it, I believe it. That's all there is to it. Amen. The reflection of it. We need to look at it and begin to see where we are missing being Christ-like. Amen. If there is anything the world needs right now is more reflection in the comparison of how we line up with acting and looking like Christ. We, a few years ago, we were in California, and I know how we'll laugh at this, but we went to uh, on the boardwalk, and we were walking down the boardwalk, and uh, his mom, Kathy, came running the, down the boardwalk. Well, as kind of a fast walk, we'll say. But she came down the boardwalk, and she said, you guys got to come and see this. You got to come see this. I said, he said, Jesus is down here singing songs. <laughs> and there was a guy dressed like Jesus, had the look of Jesus. But when Kathy said, will you sing Amazing Grace? He said, I don't know it, but you can, I can show it. Here's my list of songs that I can sing. And so I began to see the, all the things where he was telling us. He's making a getaway. Grab him, Mom. <laughs> Aren't you glad moms are so fast? <laughs> but all of that being said, and all of that being said, is, here, here's the thing. Yeah. If just because you look outside like Jesus, if your insides aren't right, you're not being Jesus. Amen. You see, I believe that the true holiness that God speaks of starts from the inside and shows on the outside. You don't have to preach about what to wear or how to act if you preach about the changing of the heart. If it begins in the heart, it will transform the outside. Amen. The conviction of the Holy Spirit will bring the transformation that is necessary. Believe it or not, it is not your job to tell people what to wear or how to look. Unless they're, they're your parents. <laughs> Nate, unless they're your parents, they can't. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm getting some amens late from the parents, but that's, you know... Uh, I never will forget one time my daughter, Caitlin, she was getting ready to leave and she was walking out to go to school. And I, I was, at that time, I was still driving him to school. And I forget how old she even was. She'd hid all morning. And the rest of the kids were eating breakfast and everything. We got ready to go get in the car. And she ran, jumped in the back seat real quick. I started to back out of the driveway and I turned around and I said, Kate, did you eat anything? What have you got on? <laughs> and she goes, well, we don't have time to change now. We got to go. I got to go. I said, no, we're all going to be late because of you. You go and change. And I said, if you come out with anything else on than what I approve of, I'll come in and pick your outfit up. That girl went in and got all covered up. But I will tell you this. As a church, we need to pray for conviction and transformation as we look to the reflection. How would Jesus act? How would Jesus act when somebody cuts him off in traffic? How would Jesus act when they have to wait a little bit? Come on. I believe I'm preaching to some people. Because I think sometimes we need to worry about the way we are in our heart much more than we need to worry about what we look like on the outside. That will transform. Amen? The Bible tells us that all Scripture, I love this. This is one of our, our Scripture that we have to memorize when we t take our test for the, the ministerial 
uh, works that we have licensing in the church of God with. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is, the, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I looked up this translation because I got, I got there was an argument that happened years ago at, at one of our general assembly meetings. It says that the man of God do you know that that translation is the plural for mankind? It doesn't matter. Look, women, God wants you to line up just like he does the man. And so this is not just for the title of the, of the person that's a pastor. It's not just for the title of a person that, that's in a position. It's about every believer that we might be equipped for the work that God has. Let me move on very quickly. <laughs> I know what time it is. I honestly do. I hear that watch beeping, so I know for sure that it's still working. Repent is the next thing that I believe that God speaks to us about. Not only are we to read the Bible, but we are to, it should cause us conviction enough to repent. Come on. You are never too big or too spiritual to need or know the necessity of repentance. Amen? Sometimes when we get a little bit older in our years, we begin to think that we know how to do it and we don't have to say, I'm sorry for anything. David was king of all of Israel and all the tribes of Israel. And he was caught in, in a very scheming project where he had sent one of his soldiers down to the front line and had them killed. He had an affair with, her, uh, with his, his wife and, and, and got her pregnant. And in order to cover up with it, had her murdered. But he thought he was beyond the realm of repentance until God dealt with him. God, I believe, will tell you this. When you read the word, it will cause you to repent. It will bring the brokenness. They had a revival that started not too long ago in one of the churches. And they had gone through the season of prayer. And then the pastor said, I believe that we need to read the word of God. And they began to read the Word of God, and as they read the Word of God, people said in the congregation, and listen, it sounds like it's really boring, but they read it for a week straight, 24 hours a day. Somebody was in that church building reading the Bible out loud. People started falling off, kept quit coming, but everybody that read, God had anointed. It was right after that that the power of God fell in their church. They had prayed for two years and not a move. But when they begin to read the word of God, the power of God. Listen, over and over in the Old Testament, when they, the prophets would find the, the word of God and call the people back to God, there was a move of God. They would cry out in repentance and saying, God, look at me, look at me, forgive me, God. Aren't you glad that he'll forgive you? That he's faithful and just to forgive you? Aren't you glad that he looks beyond your sin and sees your heart and knows you? I look at this and I begin to think about the repentance that God requires. Go ahead and pull it up. In 1 John, the first chapter, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> all unrighteousness. Repent. When you read, it should convict. When we are convicted, we should repent. Don't ignore don't move on. You know the old saying that says, don't pass, go? Go to jail. Anybody ever play that game before? A little bit of Monopoly history here. And you get to that point where it says, stop right there. You know what? I believe that when the word of God convicts us, it ought to bring that conviction to us that we stop where we are and repent. Come on. The other day, my attitude wasn't very good, and I had to stop and repent. Come on, amen. amen. It's none of your business, but I was mad. What I'm mad about is still none of your business. <laughs> but I was mad. And Don, I had to stop, look myself in the mirror and say, God, forgive me. This ain't right. I'm not looking like you when I do this. Come on, amen. 
Sometimes we've got to look at what this repentance is all about and begin to be faithful to it and begin to repent and confess our sins. That's why the scripture is in there so that we will know that we can confess what those things are that we have done and say, God, forgive me. Now, that doesn't give us an opportunity to just go out and sin and then say, oh, God can forgive me later. Come on, amen. God knows that game. That's been going on for a long time. I had a pastor friend of mine one time. He had his daughter, and I was their youth pastor at that time. She was getting ready to go out on her first, one of her first dates. Well, that he knew about anyways, but he was there, and this young man was scared to death sitting in his living room. They were waiting on her to come out, and he finally comes out, and he said, listen. He said, he put his arm around him. He said, I just wanted to tell you. He said, I am a righteous man. I believe in God. I believe that God will forgive me of anything. I believe that God would forgive me of murder. Just to let you know, I can ask forgiveness. You can't come back from the dead and ask for anything else. Just keep that in mind tonight. I'm going to tell you something. That would make a boy scared to death leaving that house. I said, that wasn't probably the the nicest thing or the right thing to say. And he goes, no, but it's true. (laughs) Repentance is something that we do. I preached a little bit and I spoke just a few minutes ago about David and his prayer of repentance. But in Psalms 51, if you're struggling today with things in your life, if there are things that you're struggling with about the repentance that is necessary, go to Psalms 51. It's one of my favorite places. I go there often because I have to repent often. And what David cried out was this, Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, a steadfast or a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me from, the, 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 from your generous spirit. He's crying out, and he begins to say, David's crying out and saying this, Father, forgive me. Let me tell you what God really wants. Is a broken and contrite heart. Broken because of the conviction. Repented. That it saturates. If you don't take time to break up the ground, it's hard for things to grow. Amen? Amen. I'm not a real great farmer, but I've farmed enough to know. I've planted enough. If you throw the seeds down, we talked about it last week, they're not going to grow very well. But if they're broken by the repentance and the correction and the development of God, it will transform and grow. Amen? Amen. When we look at that, it begins to change us. When repentance happens, it moves us. It changed David. God didn't cast David away, but he convicted his heart through his, his very works to create in him a clean heart. You see, David knew that he wasn't right with God. And some of you know right now. I'm not, I'm not here to point fingers, and I, I'm not going to tell you, that, but you know you're not where you need to be with God. You know you've been playing games with God. And God is calling you out and saying, it's time you get this right. And you need to repent. Confess those things that you've been holding on to and the transformation that you so desperately need. Go ahead. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, back to chapter, uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That scripture brings us back all the way around from where we started to the place to where we need to be to finish. And that is this. You see, I believe that if we read the scripture and it convicts us and works about it, if we repent and have a broken heart and a contrite heart that is pliable before God's hands, then we can be strong in the word. We can grow strong roots and we can begin to develop who we are and what we are so that we're not torn up when things happen. Because I can tell you something, in this world you will have sorrow is what the, or tribulation, if you will. You will have problems. Is there anybody in this place that has never had a problem? Whew, I was worried. Somebody might say. No, because we're all human. We've all gone through it. We've all been. Some of you have. This 2019 was one of the worst years you've ever experienced. Some of us have been blasted by the works of the enemy. Some of us, 2019 was the best year that we've ever had. All I can tell you about is this. you got to hold to God's hand because the storm is a coming. 
That's what the overseer preached. And I said, man, he preached the last of my sermon. Because I can tell you this. There is a storm that's coming. There are events that are going to shake the foundation of this world. And if we're not sure, we'll start falling apart. Come on. We'll start falling apart. Your foundation will begin to crumble. If your foundation is not built on Christ and it's built on the sand of this world, pleasures of this world, it will fall. I believe with all my heart that we need to understand that there is an enemy who's trying to trick us, to trip us up, to cause us to fall. If he can plot and scheme against us, he will do everything he can. Making the truth a lie, trying to work us to the place to where he can uh, lead us down a path of confusion and misdirection. But we must learn what it is to grow up into Christ. That when we grow, we grow up into him in all things, into him who is the head, that is Christ Jesus. This morning... Uh, three things, and Roberto, if you want to come up, and you and Naomi both can come if you want to. But I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Here's the thing that I want you to think about this. I, I touched on some things this morning, and I know that God is just, he spoke to my heart. As I was praying about this a couple weeks ago, I, I, I wasn't sure exactly. I knew that there were some things that I was struggling with, but I said, God, it's just as if God spoke this message to me and he preached it to me first. And God began to say, you need to get in my word more. Have you ever had anybody say to you, I read the word too much? Have you ever had anybody say to you, I read the word too much? No. But have you ever heard anybody say, I should make more time for the word? I should read it more. Is there anybody in this place that says the reason that I'm falling and failing in my life is because I don't read the word well enough, see it enough? That's why I'm struggling. Listen, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, without looking around, without anything else, with your heads, please be reverent right now for this next few moments. I feel the Holy Spirit in here speaking to hearts. You've made excuses why you can't. God says it's time that you can. Hide my word in your heart. Develop that work of studying, presenting that self, yourself before Him. Lord, right now, as we, and I join this congregation with my, with my head bowed, God. May I strive so hard this year because I know that the, the circumstances that I see down the road, uh, the things that we might face in the very near future, God, evidences of your sign and the signs that you spoke of that would, would come more often, things that would happen greater than it's ever happened. These are happening now before us. And God, right now, more than anything, we need more of your word to build that future creating us strong Heavenly Father I'll be the first to line up to say Father forgive me for putting other things before you that I get more excited about watching a football game sometimes than I do about opening the word and reading it that, I, that I'm more concerned about what show I might have missed what hobby that I might have not been able to partake in than I am the participation that I have with you. Forgive me this morning, God, across this place. God, I, I know right now that I'm going to have to be stronger spiritually than I've ever been to face the tricks and the work of the enemy. He's opening up doors and opportunities for our church to reach into a lost and dying world. We cannot afford the chance for the enemy to lure us away from you.